So I spend hours in the design space thinking up new ideas that I want to make. I'm fascinated with creating functional art, and I wanted to do a new style bowl that was more befitting a CNC machine. And that really means don't make it round, because you can make round bowls on a lathe. Hey, so my name is Corbin Dunn, and what you're watching is me prepare the base stock for a large glue up using about $64 worth of cherry. I pay about $5.19 a board foot in Reno, Nevada, which is one of the cheapest hardwoods in my area. And at least that price was a few months ago. It probably is more expensive already at this point. I feel like I always struggle with large glue ups, and I've got some ideas on how to make it better that I'll share with you in the future. Now my stock is supposed to be five inches thick, and 6'4 lumber in reality is one inch and a quarter in thickness. So one inch and a quarter times four should give me five inches. However, I didn't account for having to plane a little bit off to get all smooth after the glue up. But I modified my starting stock model in Fusion 360 to just be a touch smaller, say 4.950 inches. And this helps me in a few ways, which I'll explain in a little bit. While I wait for the glue to dry, let me talk about the design process. I wanted a curvy feel to the bowl and designed the basic shape using Fusion 360's form tool. This uses T-splines to manipulate the model, and I did a six-sided mirror to create the basic bowl shape. I modify a flat surface into the bowl shape, and then apply a thicken command to actually give it the thickness. I create a bumpy cube shape in Blender, and import it into Fusion 360. I can then do a whole bunch of clever merging and cutting to create what I call a drip stock. A drip stock is really just the mountainous terrain that you see that I start out with. I like to make a removable spoil board for my bowl projects, and the reason why will come up in just a little bit. I start by cutting a piece of MDF to be about one inch wider on all sides than my stock piece. This extra spacing will give me somewhere to actually clamp the temporary spoil board down onto my CNC table. Since I wanted my stock to be offset one inch, I decided to make some one inch spacers by just ripping them out on the table saw. I can clamp these spacers to the edge of my temporary spoil board. I probably could have just drawn a line on, but I wanted it to be easier to just align everything up. So I've become a fan of the double side tape method for holding down my work pieces. I strongly prefer it over the blue tape and CA glue method of holding down work pieces. I always tightly scrape the tape down before removing the backing. This is the part that sticks the best simply because of the hard scraping that I do. At this point, a lot of people will just take the work piece and push it down the table and call it good, but I found that that will come loose, and so what I like to do is clamp it down. I just take all the clamps, clamp it down temporarily for just a brief moment, and remove the clamps. If you actually watch it, it squishes the tape down and really gives you a lot more consistency in uh, the way that it's adhering to the table. My 3D printed toe clamps work really well and they're easily adaptable for any length and height. Check out the description for how to get these files so you can print some of your own at home on your 3D printer. My quarter 20 nut handle design needed some improvement as they tend to break off. I thought I could solve it by printing them in an angle, but I finally decided to do a new design that is much sturdier, easier to print, just at the expense of using more filament. I used my Hymer 3D sensor to touch off and zero the X, Y, and Z axis, but using a touch plate will work just as well. This single origin will be the origin for all three machining operations that I'm going to do. For most of my projects, I set the Z0 location to be my spoil board, but in this case, it needs to be the removable spoil board. And on top of that, I have the double-sided tape, so I want to be above the double-sided tape. I can easily find that height by putting some double-sided tape on a scrap piece of MDF and using that to touch off on my Z. If I was manually changing bits, I would touch off the Z each time at the same location. But I only have to do it once because I have an automatic tool changer. My split brush dust shoe design allows me to watch the CNC machine as the process starts 
and make sure everything's okay. You can download this if you haven't seen my video, I'll put a link to it. So the first thing I wanted to do was drill some quarter inch alignment holes. Doing the full depth holes with an upcut bit helps avoid it being too large. Then the same upcut bit was used for roughing. After the roughing was complete, I used a quarter inch ball nose to do the final pass. And this took about an hour and 20 minutes. The advantage of the removable spoil board is that I can take it off and keep everything aligned at the same location and do some other operations. It's important to over pour epoxy a little bit so you can ensure that everything is going to be filled up. And I don't want any of it to pour out, so I just use some silicone sealant around the profile of my epoxy area to keep it contained. I mixed up some quick seal epoxy and put a touch of pigment in it. I could then paint it on the mountains to seal the wood. I found that this step is somewhat necessary. I don't get air bubbles if I don't do it, but the epoxy, when it's a deep pour epoxy, will soak into the wood and I will actually see that in the finished piece. So to prevent that, I seal it. I've done this enough to know that the epoxy will pool at the bottom of the machined wood mold and it shows up in the final piece. I mitigate that by propping it up on the side and letting most of it drip out. I kind of help it just a little bit with a heat gun to make it flow better. The quick seal epoxy was tacky about 45 minutes later, but it's starting to get a little bit firm, and that's when I decided to do the main pour. I mixed up some Wise Bond deep pour epoxy, add the pigment, and poured it in. The epoxy and pigment cost about $47 worth of materials, kind of ignoring shipping and taxes. I feel like the dust boot could get in the way of my deep carving, so I took it off and I just let the chips fly everywhere. In the last video, I talked about how my dog holes allow precision repeatability. This is a perfect case where I use them to realign the workpiece at exactly the same spot as before. This gets back to my stock being slightly taller than when I modeled it in Fusion 360. I can do a facing operation with a two inch bit to make everything perfectly flat on the top. And it's always important to mark the front so I can realign things where they need to be. Now, I don't think I needed to use as much double-sided tape as I did, and it was really secured and hard to get off. The spoil board gets some mirrored holes on it using the same drilling parameters as before. I took the temporary spoil board off and got things ready for the next operation. I like to do the bottom and outside my bowls first, as it provides a large flat area to utilize for the second operation and avoids any tabs. I tapped in some quarter inch wood dowels for alignment. Only two are necessary, but I used three to prevent any racking. I forgot to take the old tape off, but I noticed my heat gun made it really easy to peel it off. Then, like before, it's a quick clamp on and clamp off just to get to squish down and adhere the double side tape really well. I put it back on the machine at the exact same location and started the roughing pass. I like to use Fusion 360's adaptive clearing strategy. It rapidly removes a lot of stock and gets everything really close for good finishing pass. The simulations in Fusion 360 told me that bit collision was not likely, but I started to wonder about the back of my Z-axis spindle mount. On my first deep salad bowl, I knew this was going to be a problem and I cut off about an inch on the bottom area, so I didn't think it'd be an issue. On the next deep roughing pass, I slowed the feed down to 25%, and it was clear that I would have a collision, so I hit the feed pause and then feed stop. Now, I don't really want to move the whole spindle down on the mount, which I could do, because when I watch the machine operations, I think for given forces, it's better to have it right where it is, and so that's why I decided to cut it off. I used a hacksaw like I did the first time, and it probably took like an hour to actually cut it off. Restarting G-code in the middle of a file isn't too hard with Mach 4. If you guys want to know some tips on how to do this, let me know, and maybe I can make a video about it. Once the main roughing area was finished, I did a finishing pass 
who are facing the top of the bowl, well, really the bottom. And this gives me an area to flip over and mount down securely. After that, it was on to the finishing pass. In one of my other videos that I'll link to, I talk about using a jig for aligning a bowl on the second operation when doing two-side machining. This works really well, and I decided to do it again. So I cut out a piece of MDF, and I mount it to the same temporary spoil board. I offset it physically to where it needed to be based on my CAD file. Precise mounting wasn't very important because I first drilled some alignment holes into the jig, and then through the entire piece and into the spoil board. This would give me precision alignment with respect to the spoil board, and that's all I really needed. I let the machine fly through the MDF. I did 390 inches per minute and a 3 8 of an inch depth of cut with a 3 8 of an inch upcut bit. Then a finishing pass is similar as what I've done before. I prefer the morphed spiral now for organic shapes like these bowls. Now the jig has to let the bottom of the bowl sit just a little bit proud of the jig itself, so that's the thing that will be taped down and not the jig. But when I put the jig on it, it was just sitting a little bit too high. I took it off by hand and started trimming it a bit because I should have done a profile pass on the inside of the jig to remove this area and I just didn't do it. But even so, it just was really flush with the bottom and that wouldn't work. I needed to be a little bit lower. So I put some double-sided tape on it and put it back down roughly in the same location on my CNC machine. I just pushed it down. Yeah, I didn't use clamps, but facing really doesn't have a lot of forces and I didn't think I'd have any issues. I did a couple of surfacing passes, took about 50 thousandths of an inch off in total, and that was good to go. So I pushed some quarter inch wood dowels into the spoil board and they sit proud about half an inch. I set the jig down on the bowl and made sure it was aligned really well without any slop. I also made sure the front was pointing in the same direction as the bowl itself. I could then tape over the bottom of the bowl and the jig. I used as much tape as I could for this operation as I wanted really good adhesion because there was less surface area. The tape can also overlap the jig a bit and that's not going to be an issue because the jig is now sitting lower than the bowl bottom. I kind of align the jig over the dowels by eye and just slowly coerce them down into the holes and then push it down with my hands. At that point, I can do the clamp on, clamp off technique to really get it to squish down. I use some cowls to kind of get it in the middle. Next, it was back to the CNC machine using that same spot on the table. I did the same operations as the outside of the bowl at the same speeds. This is where it's really essential to use an upcut bit to have all the chips evacuate really well, particularly since I wasn't using any dust collection. I did get more chatter than I'd like on this bowl, and I think I'm going to tweak some of the acceleration, and I think that will help with some of the issues. But what that means is I had to do a lot of sanding, and no one really likes sanding. I used a combination of my random orbital sander uh, hand sanding, and a Dremel multi-tool with a triangle sanding disc to get all the areas. I used 150 as a starting grit, or 120 in some cases, and after 150 I jumped up to 220. I sand the bowl entirely with 220, and then I like to raise the grain a bit, so I spray it with some clean water, wipe most of the water off, and let it raise the grain and dry, and then I can sand it again with 220. The epoxy area I sanded again with 320 to get a little bit finer of a finish. And I think I should start going a little bit higher, at least 400, maybe 600, because sometimes you can see some of the finishing scratches uh, in the workpiece. For my finish of these bowls, I like to use Osmo Top Oil. This is my preference for a bowl. It's pretty durable and it's easy to apply. There just really isn't much to it. I take a small rag and wipe on a light coat on the entirety of the bowl, and then I wipe most all of it off with another rag. I wait eight to 10 hours, and then I put on another coat. That means I can kind of get two coats in one day, one in the morning, one in the evening, 
and it just takes me maybe three days to finish it because I usually put on about four coats in total. So let's check out the final bowl. So I'm considering making the Fusion 360 files available for this project. If you're interested, let me know. Usually I make a set of directions along with the files so you can make the project. What I found is not as many people like Fusion 360 and a lot more people use the Vectric V-Carve. And uh, for me, Fusion is just way better. So thanks everyone.